Okay, next order of business <clears throat> is a joint meeting with uh, the Selco Commission and with um, representatives of the advisory board for Shrewsbury Media Connection. Um, Mr. Hill, you have a, a brief presentation. Yes. Like Mr. Swain, you have a statement you'd like to make after that, and then we'll start the discussion. I want to um, caution everyone, this is not a public hearing. This is only a meeting between Selco and the advisory board. Um, there's a public uh, uh, comment period, and we more than likely will be having a public hearing somewhere down the road, but that could be a month and a half away. So um, the process tonight will be Mr. Hill will present. Um, if we have any questions, we'll ask him. We'll have Mr. Swidean make a statement, and we're just going to have a discussion about what, what this means uh, what's in the um, what's what's in the uh, proposed amendment, and uh, just see what ideas come come out of that. So, good evening, Mr. Hill. Uh, thank you. Uh, with me this evening are three members of the Salco Commission: uh, Tony Trippi, Maria Lemieux, and Mike Ruffalo. And if you would like, Mr. Swider and Mike want to introduce his advisory board sure. members who are here. Yes, I have uh, Dr. Camarada Mateel and Nick Tedesco. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Um, as you recall, um, we met last in September, and I asked uh, the board to convene this meeting. I'd like to make a presentation uh, before we get into the question and answer period. Um, just a little bit of a background on the issue. Um, Public access uh, entity was formed shortly after the franchise was awarded to then Shrewsbury Electric Light Plant in 1983. Uh, documents in 1985, uh, correspondence between then general manager of, of the Selco um, or Shrewsbury Electric Light Plant, Jim Baker, and um, Bob Maroney, who was chairman of the Board of Selectmen at the time, um, indicated that the public access entity was intended to be formed as a nonprofit all along from its onset. An application for 501c3 status was rejected by the IRS because Selco, at the time, desired to retain control over the public access employees and expenditures, and I believe it to be primarily because at the time the operation was not operating profitably and that the, it was at its early onset and that there was some um, desire to control all expenses as best could be done. Um, the nonprofit initiative was dropped uh, in the late 1980s, and the Public Access Advisory Board, uh, an arrangement between this, uh, non this group and Selco, um, started. And it has been in existence since that time in 1991 with loose oversight by uh, the Selco Commission and myself. Fast forward to 2014, uh, Selco <coughs> conducted a strategic roadmap and hired a consultant, a five-year strategic plan. The consultant that was hired was CCG uh, out of Florida. Uh, it's a consulting firm that handles a lot of strategic planning for small cable operators like ours. And there were a number of findings in that report, one of which was that Selco uh, spends more than any other client that they have on the public access <coughs> function. That said, we did not target that as an immediate fix. There were other things that were far more important to us uh, when we received that report in June of 2014. And we've picked away at a lot of the recommendations and implemented them, like changing our phone product, starting a commercial sales program, um, implementing a franchise fee, staying current with programming increases. And now we're addressing some of the other issues that were uh, in the report. In September of 2015, we started a working group to study the issue. A member of the Board of Selectmen was invited and we've been meeting uh, since that time. Um, 
we um, the roadmap report was something we reviewed. The working group was formed in 2015, and then we hired uh, Bill August, a noted cable attorney in Massachusetts, to assist us uh, in in this review. I think he was used by the town in the last franchise agreement, and he's also done some work for SMC. Uh, the advisory board uh, weighed in once the draft documents were available for the input in the spring of 2016. So I guess the question is why now? And really, it's to address the findings in the report, to, to really address the lack of formal administrative oversight um, of the agency. Uh, the overwhelming majority of public access entities are nonprofits. Uh, this, the next two uh, points I'd like to get across is cable operators are not really in the business of being free speech referees. A number of cable operators totally divorced themselves from uh, handling the public access function because they did not want to get into uh, overseeing disputes as to what free speech is and isn't. And cable operators should not be involved in programming channel placement decisions. That's been an issue in the last couple of years as to what programs should be on what channel. Uh, and that's really not something that Selco or the commission feels that it should be in the decision making that would be better made by a nonprofit board like it is in the other um, systems around the state. So the question is, how does this happen? There are municipal employees now. How do they go from a municipally uh, run organization to one that's municipally funded but run by a nonprofit? There's really three steps that need to uh, occur. The first is we need to amend the existing franchise agreement between the Board of Selectmen and the Commission. That's really what we're here for tonight to discuss. The second two steps are that there needs to be an, a new agreement developed between the new nonprofit entity and the Board of Selectmen, as there is in every other community or most every other community in the Commonwealth. And lastly, um, the new entity needs to create bylaws to which spell out its operating procedures. The focus tonight really is on the first item only. Even though we have developed uh, some working documents for the board to review on the second two items with input from uh, members of the advisory board. Uh, the franchise amendment process is governed by uh, the state's um, Department of Telecommunication, Telecommunication and Cable under their regulation CMR 3.07. Uh, it spells out a process which is fairly formal. There must be a newspaper ad um, uh, announcing to the general public that a change is being sought. Uh, coinciding with the ad, a report on the amendment must be published. Uh, the full text must be identified, the purpose for and a description on the probable impacts <coughs> on consumers must be available for the public to review. After 14 days, uh, after 14 days of which the ad is placed in the paper, a 21-day public comment period begins. <coughs> the amendment then is adopted after that public comment period uh, if both the issuing authority, which in this case is the Board of Selectmen, and SELCO uh, agree on the terms of the change. Within 10 days of the adoption, a written report must be specified must be filed with the state specifying the reasons for the adoption. So uh, in, Selco would like to have this um, completed by the end of the calendar year. The time uh, table is somewhat tight, but we believe it can be done. Just to now walk you through, and I think you have before you, um, the existing franchise agreement um, the proposed changes I'd li like to just summarize briefly. Uh, there is a definition section in the agreement. Um, we did add uh, a number of items to the definitions. Uh, section 2 uh, now denotes that we'd like to see the entity <coughs> operated by a nonprofit. Section 3 establishes a new access designee. 
section 4.5, which would be new, uh, formally establishes the amendment to the agreement. Uh, and there are other mis miscellaneous changes referencing the new access designee throughout the preamble and the, um, the beginning section. Uh, the meat of the changes occur in section six of the franchise agreement. And that section spells out the role of public access. Again, section 6.1 announces that there'll be a new access designee. Section 6.2 uh, is an amendment to reflect a new nonprofit designation. Section 6.3 provides a couple of changes. One uh, provides language pertaining to high definition program programming that wasn't in the last agreement something that Shrewsbury Media Connection has adopted uh, at their expense. Uh, section 4 uh, states that the Board of Selectmen uh, shall request an annual meeting with the new designee. Section 6.4 provides for uh, a provision for rent, rental of facilities. 6.4 continues, spells out, and this, this needs to be worked on a little bit further, but we need to have a process in which all the assets used by the existing SMC transfer from the municipal entity to the new nonprofit for their use. That might need a little bit of legal fine tuning. Um, also in section 6.4, uh, we added language that if for some reason Selco would uh, need to relocate uh, Shrewsbury Media Connection from their existing facility at Parker Road that Selco would be <coughs> responsible for the cost of that move. We don't really see any need to do that. We don't have, that's not on our radar for any reason. But if, if that need uh, arose, it would be on our dime, that expense. Uh, section 6.5, that changes the funding mechanism. Currently in the franchise agreement, uh, it calls for 3% of video revenue plus two full-time employees paid out of the Selco budget, a cable budget, plus all fringe uh, benefits for all employees of the um, Shoot Media Connection to be paid for. The proposed <coughs> change provides for four and a half percent of all video revenue to be uh, paid to the uh, nonprofit entity of which one half of 1% would be used for a rent placeholder. Under the federal statute, the maximum uh, that a cable operator pays to a, um, to, the, to a community, in most cases the money goes through the community, is 5% of video only revenue. In Shrewsbury, Selco pays existing 3% to SMC plus two employees, plus all the fringe benefit expenses, and in addition pays 800000 to the town. So we are, you know, <coughs> if we were to pay the 5%, it would be slightly less than $500,000 per year. We're paying $1,251,000 currently. Uh, we are proposing, uh, SELCO is, that the new funding mechanism be effective January 1 of 2017. Uh, we are also uh, proposing that the new nonprofit designee formally assume control and oversight of the agency on January 1, 2019. And the reason for that delay is during our review process, uh, it was uncovered, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the impact on the pension for those existing municipal employees who would be removed from municipal status to a nonprofit status and its impact on their pension. Um, so we, we looked into what pension options were available to uh, the new um, entity, and I'll get into that in just a minute. A uh, couple other points. Um, you know, it, it spells out <coughs> that the new designee shall fundraise to supplement. Uh, any additional operational expenses that they might need. And in section 610, it, it acknowledges that the existing advisory board as, it, it, as it's run today 
would cease to operate when a new designee uh, comes into place. So let's talk a little bit about the pension um, implications for existing employees. In studying this issue with the retirement office, uh, we uncovered that there is a pension benefit available to state and municipal employees whose jobs are eliminated. There are certain requirements. It's referred to as a termination benefit. There are certain requirements that must be met uh, in order for the employees to be eligible to get the benefit. Uh, primarily, it requires a 20-year service with the, with it, within the system. Two of the employees currently employed uh, by SMC are close to 20 years, within two years of that service. And so there was a, a strong advocacy by the advisory board that if this pension benefit were available, that we delay um, the nonprofit status and s until such time as the two employees had the 20 years needed um, to exercise their rights to take it. Um, there are other um, implications of the, of the uh, termination benefit, and one of which is uh, there's a forever ban from taking another uh, Massachusetts um, pension eligible job. So once the employee options to take this, he or she cannot go back into the pension system. So it's a difficult decision. <coughs> uh, the benefit um, would be based on the average of the top five years salary for the employee. The other uh, issue that came <coughs> up was one of a, a legal issue involving um, the conflict of interest statute or the ethics statute of the Commonwealth. And it was determined that um, employees uh, subjected to Section 18 and 19 they're very limited in their uh, ability to negotiate as, as employees of the new nonprofit entity to negotiate on behalf uh, with the community once in their new role. We hired uh, an employment uh, lawyer uh, who's very well versed in the ethics statute, and we're in the process of walking through um, the, the uh, programming coordinator so that he is well aware of what his limitations are in terms of what he can and cannot do in the future. We think we have a workable plan and that he'll be able to run the day-to-day -day operations of the new entity. However, he will not be in a position to negotiate on behalf of the entity and that will have to be done uh, by the um, board members of the advisory committee. And again, legal will advise as we move forward. So in terms of the schedule for the proposed changes, um, we met on September 27th this evening. Uh, I've asked that you, we, we discuss this um, matter in a public setting and that the advisory board have a chance to give you input on their concerns. Um, on October 25th, uh, as per um, the regulation, I'd like to have a draft report available for your consideration. It's a report that needs to be issued by both SELCO and the Board of Selectmen, voted on. Uh, after which, if, if approved, we will um, commence the public notice in the newspaper. A copy will be available to the town clerk. It will be posted on the websites of the Board of Selectmen and SELCO. And then we'll put that in the paper. Uh, hopefully by November 14th, uh, 21 days, or on, number, on November 14th, uh, the 21-day period would begin. It would end by, on December 6th, and on December 13th, the Board of Selectmen, I believe, has a regularly scheduled meeting, at which time um, the Suckle Commission um, would entertain uh, the last meeting and take action on the proposed amendment if you see it as a viable option. I, I also gave to you uh, this evening a copy of the proposed budget. A lot of time was spent putting this together. Uh, Maria Lemieux, who's the CPA and our, one of our commission members, spent a lot of time working with me and the finance manager for SELCO. And um, the budget shows what their funds would be at 4% and at 4.5%. And it also shows 
what their expenditures were uh, in 2015. Uh, we feel at a four and a half percent budget, <coughs> one half of one percent earmark towards um, the rent that, 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 that there is adequate funding in place for the uh, the new nonprofit to uh, operate. Uh, moving forward and in closing, there's really three things that need to happen. We need to finalize this process on amending the franchise agreement. Uh, the a new entity or the advisory board, in lieu of the new entity until such time as it's formally organized, uh, needs to develop um, an agreement between the Board of Selectmen and themselves as to their operation. And uh, bylaws need to be developed for the new entity. And uh, Lou has uh, spent some time working on that, and we have a draft copy subject to change available for inspection. Again, it's in draft format. It was taken from, I believe, two communities, uh, Andover and Wellesley. What was that correct? Andover and Wellesley are the two. Uh, a lot from the state of California up on the land. Um, it was the first draft. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, drew it up as I saw it. It needs to be reviewed by a lawyer and looked at from a legal standpoint. And, uh, but there are bylaws available <coughs> throughout the co simple bylaws available for all nonprofits. And uh, again, we, we need to work towards final implementation of 1 1 2019. So, with that, <coughs> I would um, give the floor back to you. I'd like to ask questions of Mr. Hill now or have Mr. Swain uh, come up. Question, Excuse if I could, Mr. Sure. Michael, you've referenced a new entity or the board repeatedly during this evening. A new entity? The new entity or the board, the advisory board? Yes. What if they, are they any, are, are they under any obligation to accept this opportunity? Um, the existing yeah. board? They're, they're not formally organized, so they could say they don't like it, but it's really an agreement between the board of selectmen and the Selco Commission. Now that said, we had numerous meetings with two of their advisory board members who were in communication with the other advisory board members, and we feel, and I can't speak for them, that we've reached um, a reasonable uh, point of compromise on <coughs> how we would move forward. Okay, but just to make sure I understand this, you still need this third party. Right, yes. Board of Selectmen can do what it wants to do, Selco can do what it wants to yeah. do, but at the end of the day, you need some group of people to constitute this new entity. Correct. And to accept those responsibilities. Correct. If one does not organically develop from within this room or within this town, right. do you propose going out and creating one on your own? Well, the um, proposal, the draft proposal, you know, tonight I wanted to focus on the franchise agreement, but in terms of an agreement between the new entity and um, the Board of Selectmen, um, it, it, the, the draft proposal calls for the Board of Selectmen to appoint two members and for the um, advisory board or the new entity hmm. to appoint four and that the uh, program manager be the fifth kind of, or the seventh member, <laughs> so two, four, and one. I understand that. I, it was a very complete briefing book you gave us, but at the end of the day, it strikes me that in, f if this were to move forward, yeah. you, you require this yet-to-be-identified group yes. to form and actually then receive these obligations. Right. Uh, that is correct. Let me, just so I'm clear, not that I want to go this way, but, um, the board could technically solicit proposals from <coughs> competing groups on running public access, correct? Uh, they could. It, so It's not what we had in mind. No, 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 I, I, and I'm not saying we should do that, but in the, I think to Mr. Kane's point, if, if the, the current advise, advisory board um, or, or Shrewsbury Media um, Connection organization, the members, don't want to do it, we, do, we have the opportunity yes, to correct. do something else. So it's, 
Um, it's not like all of a sudden, well, hopefully all of a sudden there wouldn't be something, but, um, okay. Be before we go into anything else, because I'm sure we have questions, I'd like Mr. Swayant to come up and um, just make a brief presentation. I'm, I'm not going to make a formal presentation. I just want to position the advisory board in terms of what we are and what we are not. Um, SMC is actually two different groups. There's one group which is part of SELCO, and that consists of the employees, the assets, the facilities, the accounting, the uh, entire shop, if you will. The second group is the membership, and members have to uh, sign an agreement that they will abide by certain membership rules in order to use the equipment or to be a producer. Uh, and this has gone on since 1983. Uh, it's a little bit like the Hotel California. You come in and you sign and you never leave because it's not a one-year membership. It's a forever membership. And there are even a set of bylaws and prescribes the membership in terms of uh, if you're before 1993, you have additional privileges. Out of that membership comes the advisory board. The membership uh, has an annual meeting and they elect for two years advisory board members, seven people. The bylaws says that the membership is represented uh, by the advisory board and the advisory board is also advisory to the uh, SMC manager and to the Light Commission. It make it very clear the advisory board has no authority over any operations, any management. It has no fiduciary responsibility. I've been uh, a member of the advisory board for five years and I've never seen a set of financial statements. I've never seen a complete equipment list and all of the details around capital equipment. Uh, so I think that's very important when you talk about the advisory board making decisions and the like. Um, there was loose oversight, but the good news is I think that SMC was very well run. And I think that in all that time, I've never seen anyone complain about the operations, the service, uh, and I believe that you people have had a lot of interaction with the uh, SMC staff, and uh, they're fantastic people. And, and I want to make it clear that none of this reflects on them. They really have done a super job. And I think that the advisory board uh, are producers, they <coughs> are citizens. We're very interested in public access. I think also, and maybe Mike alluded to it, but we're at a transition point. Uh, cable access TV is right now in a transition. It's a mature industry, and the future is the Internet. It's on-demand, high-speed streaming. <clears throat> I have a device at home called a, an Amazon Echo. I don't even know what to call it. <laughs> I talk to it, I say, Alexa, play Chopin, and Alexa plays Chopin off of Amazon. There's all these new technologies coming out, and I like to think that we're not talking about, for the future, public access TV, but public access communications. And so whatever we do, we need to look at what's happening from the technology and the finances to operate for the next 20 years and not try to design a system for the last 20 years. So uh, that's kind of uh, all I really wanted to say. Uh, I don't know if either one of my uh, co-members uh, here want to say anything. Um, Nick, did you want to say something? You, you, you can pull a chair and come up. Yeah. You can that's, both pull a chair and come up. That's the best thing to do, yeah. The commission wants to come up. The commission can come up. Are you sure? No? All right. Um, so I'm not here just as an advisory member. I'm here also as a parent of a student who has been greatly benefited by the um, by SMC and its scholarship and who is now actually uh, making all of us proud at University of Southern California in the multimedia section. So we are here basically because even though we have been involved with multiple discussions okay. over last seven, eight months with the CELCO sure. committee, 
we do have certain concerns which still remain unanswered and the pathways need to be carved out. So with that, I would stop here until we discuss further. Do you, can I, Pat, do you have a list of those concerns that we could get, not necessarily tonight, but we could get so we could take a look at them? Sure. 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 We, we, get we, don't, we don't have a list one by one typed up and developed, it's but right. we surely know what they are and can get them to you without a problem. Sure. Good. I think one of our biggest issues is around employees. We're doing this after 20 years of employment with the town, and so we are very concerned that the employees are not the victims, if you will. Uh, we agree that it's probably a good idea to look at the organization and uh, perhaps uh, come up with a new organization for the future. Uh, it's in the details of that. Uh, I heard mentioned that the advisory board would negotiate. We've looked at these three documents. We've given feedback on them. Essentially, that feedback, some of it was implemented, some of it wasn't. Uh, we feel like we've done our due diligence. We're not going to be uh, the new board of directors. Maybe some will, some won't. But it's the new board of directors that has to sign off on it. So we can put down clauses that we'd like to see, and you hand it to the new board, as you said, Mr. Kane, and they look at it, and our very first suggestion gets thrown out as something they don't want. So it's important to look at who has to sign off on this uh, new corporation, on this new agreement. Uh, and, and so I think that's an important consideration. Uh, for example, the three-way agreement that I see it right now, it's very unspecific. I don't think that I certainly wouldn't as a new board member sign it. Uh, essentially, you're asking people to uh, provide services for whole categories, such as town meetings and all the rest. No quantitative statement, and yet you are supposed to operate at a certain financial level. The budget that uh, Selco presented, I think, is inadequate to operate at the level that we are now. Uh, last year's budget, according to the town report for 2015, was $501,000. The year before that, it was 464. I don't have numbers for this year yet. Again, I, as I mentioned earlier, we've never seen any kind of financial reports uh, on actuals or month-by-month uh, -month budget versus actuals. But let's say that it's coming in at about $484,000. The proposal that you saw with Selco is $400,000. That's a 20% cut, roughly. And if you know a way to provide the same level of services for 20% more, uh, good luck. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, uh, Nick, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I just, um, <clears throat> I just want to support some of the things that Lou had said, but in the primary thing being that the, uh, the employees are our primary concern, uh, that they are treated with the, um, the concern that they're, that they're, um, they're due. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, for instance, if you look forward to uh, the new entity that um, Mr. Hale is recommending, proposing. Um, I'm not sure whether or not the a, a benefit package um, in terms of the, a startup organization would be anywhere near um, what the town offers today uh, for these <coughs> same employees. So uh, that would be a primary concern, you know, one of my um, main concerns. I think that um, the employees that are, have been there, you know, during my tenure of working there with the um, with all the athletics that I've done in town for the last 18 years with, with my crew and um, the various producers that I've worked with over the years down there. Um, the staff does, a, does an admirable job, and I don't need to tell you guys that. You all, you all recognize that. You know that. Um, there may be one person in town that doesn't know that you've produced, what, over a 1,000 programs? It's not about me. <laughs> no. It's not no. about me. But uh, the, the, the concern, he goes, he goes the, way back. I've produced uh, over uh, 84 programs. Uh, uh, my wife and I do a program called Arts and Ideas. So. And Namrata has been involved in a number of programs. You know. So, um, yeah. 
you know, we my, are all producers here. My 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 concern is that um, you know I just want to make sure these 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 people that have been down there that I've called on all hours of the t of the day I've called some of the employees down there that um, I've seen hours in the morning at five o'clock in the morning asking to open up the studio and they've come in on their own own free time over the, over a number of years and uh, I don't know if. The people at home that are turning on their channels to channel 28, uh, 328, 29, um, all of the three pound channels recognize the behind the scenes work that goes into running a television program. And uh, um, I just want to make sure that we're doing the right, that we do the right thing. Because I would I really <coughs> hate to mess this up after, because it, it offers the town of Shrewsbury so much more um, than a lot of the other towns receive uh, in the area. And I hope the residents. Uh, recognize that as well. How fortunate we are uh, to have such a good, uh, a good thing in Shrewsbury. Um, if you look at if you look at the various communities in the state, I know that uh, Shrewsbury is recognized as one of the forefront communities of bringing high definition to uh, to um, public access and, and this type of channeling. Um, it was one of the first communities to do that, and um, that was done under the leadership of Bill Nay, who's not long. Ago isn't here any longer, but um, we still have the staff that's there. And uh, just, just want to, I just want to reiterate that you know, it's I want to make sure that the employees are taken care of, and that's my primary concern, among um, others. Yeah, right. I have a um, few things. So, just to summarize what we are trying to say, the most important points that we have are first and foremost the employees given the ethics issue and um, the conflict of interest issue. We want to make, from our side, we want to make every honest effort that the employees, current employees, are given complete assurance in the form of a waiver that they will not be uh, punished or prohibited for going to the non-profit entity. Afterwards, and that's something we definitely request that we have in writing, because we may not be there, Mike may not be there, some of us might be around, and so we just want to make sure of that. And we have few things in process, but we all know that things can be interpreted differently in the court of law. So today, the documents that we are running with the current attorneys uh, are they still have so much gray zone that it, it is subject to interpretation. And so we just want to make sure that in no way we can make injustice to these people. The second thing is that we need to have a back, backup plan for the shortfall for the budget. Because when we talk in terms of percentage amount of revenue going to the entity, we are forgetting that the percentage amounts may not equilibrate with the total amount that is needed to run the entity. And as we all know, there's a certain amount that is always going to be necessary to run the entity. We understand that we can apply for grants and things like that. But again, high school gets prolific service from this entity. The Board of Selectmen, the town, everyone gets a lot of service from this entity. It's such an asset that we should not lose it just because we cannot keep up with it. It's Shrewsbury is a very upcoming town, pretty famous in the state of Massachusetts, if not beyond. And so if we can keep up our nose up there and make everyone proud and actually walk the walk along with changing times, all the citizens will be very happy. So that is another thing. The third thing I want to include here is that we're talking of rent going forward. Currently, if this entity is serving the town, the board of selectmen, maybe the town can make a provision that this entity will be either provided with a physical space that they will not be charged for, or otherwise, if they're going to rent, then there has to be room for inflation just like every other rent that we have, we have that provision, which is not in the current budget. Um, and one more thing is that we definitely want to make sure that there is a public hearing on these issues. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Hill, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Could I just respond to a couple things before? Sure. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind what the federal regulation is, and that's 5% of video revenue goes to the town for its decision in most cases as to how to allocate those funds. Most communities allocate a great portion of that to public access. Our proposal is to maintain 800,000 for the town and also give four and a half percent, which would be greater than any other community in the state. So I think it's important to keep that in mind as we're under great pressure to keep rates as low as we can um, with the tremendous pressure we're under from programming cost increases and the, uh, the negative publicity and feedback we get as a result of those. We would like to give everybody as much as we can, but it's a zero-sum game, and there's only so much around. And I think our proposal is fair at $1.25 million versus 500000 which would be allowed for under the federal regulation. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that I agree with almost everything Lou said, um, but I, I th and uh, as well as the others, it's just that to Nick's point, um, when I first started uh, in 2011, 2012, the idea of um, having uh, high definition TV for public access was brought to my attention from the then uh, manager, Bill Nay. And I, I said, well, let's take a step back here. There were only two other communities, I think New York City and Palo Alto, California, who had it. And I said, is this really something that Shrewsbury should be considering? So I asked that Bill bring it before the Shrewsbury, or to, before the Suckle Commission to present it. And the outcome of that discussion and presentation <coughs> was that Selco doesn't really have the ability to veto or deny that expense. Those funds are given to SMC under the franchise agreement, the 3% plus the employees, for them to determine how they best want to spend them. There's no controls on those monies. And so that's another reason which brings us before you tonight is to establish a process, an entity that can have that type of oversight and controls in place. Uh, for policy decisions like that. So even if the commission didn't agree with proceeding with the um, high definition request, which was over $100,000, I believe, then we had to let it go. So, I mean, that's why we're, one of the reasons we're here tonight. I think we're not in disagreement that there ought to be a separation between Selco and SMC. Ideally, it, ha it should have happened 30 years ago. Part of the problem is uh, we've got 20-year employees. So that's an issue. The other thing is it is a matter of, of management. And as I said earlier, the advisory board has not been managing SMC. It's been essentially either managing itself or managing itself with some benign neglect from Selco. They're all Selco employees. It's a Selco accounts. It's a Selco facility. The equipment's on Selco books. So uh, if you're looking to the advisory board, we've got to restructure anyway because we don't manage. I just want to uh, point out one thing. Uh, when we had the discussion, the, all the discussions and the written documents we were provided with were uh, the talk of 4% or 4.5%, we never received any documents that said 5%. In the proposal you put forward tonight, you talked about 5%. So that's just a little um, well, documents. Did, Maybe we didn't receive those. I didn't those. put a proposal forward to 5% for SMC. I'm saying the federal lake regulation for the town is a maximum of 5% for all um, payments. Yeah. So, and so no other, excuse me, Namrata, but oh, if there were a, a private cable operator in this community, that would be the max. And there's a provision in the contract in the existing franchise agreement, should another private cable operator come into town, that Selco um, would follow the payment of what the private entity would pay. Right. So that money is, in essence, go away. 
So the po point is, um, it's not just limited to Selco. The point I'm trying to make to the Board of Selectmen is that uh, this particular entity, which is such a valuable resource to the town, um, if from whatever amount comes out of Selco's budget and goes to this new entity, we need to have, as a town, we need to have a backup plan where the shortfall is going to be covered because not always we get grants, not always there's going to be a successful fundraiser. We're assuming here that there are going to be people in town who are going to have time to do fundraisers. We all know that every single day I get like 50 requests for donations. It's like we all cannot continue to pay in every place. So all I'm requesting is that to run the same quality program and today we are in HD, we're going to 4K already, and there's going to be many more transitions, those will be coming. So just like how we did a wonderful job with the public library, it's an impressive place, it's not just a structure anymore, everyone's raving about it, we need to do equally good, if not better job with the new entity. Um, we, we have facts around cost in, 2014, it was 464,000. In 2015, it was 501. I think it will come in at something like 480, again, depending on how much you put into a cash reserve for future capital equipment requests, which is being neglected and, and really, uh, from an accounting standpoint, needs to be revised in, in our opinion. However, that's 500,000. I've asked Mark to give me an estimate for what it would cost to give you the same level of service with a new entity, and he came up with a number of 520000 So the fact of the matter is, if you like the services you get, and I assume that from every corner we hear we love what SMC is doing, it's approximately a $500,000 a year operation. <coughs> Selco is showing a budget that shows you getting $400,000. That's a 20% cut. You can play around with percentages, but when it comes down to paying the bill, they want dollars, not percentages. So that's the dilemma. You've got $800,000 coming in from Selco, and it's going directly to the town. SMC needs $500,000 to deliver the same services. And the employee problem, those are the two big issues, quite frankly. Along with what's happening from a technological standpoint, for the last two or three years, uh, there's been a drop in subscribers, and I think you're doing some sort of a study right now. Yeah. Uh, so I don't feel like the future is going to be a big increase in subscribers. So we need to deal with how do we communicate. And as I say, there's new communication methods. I like to think of it as public access communications, not public access TV, because um, back in business school 101, you know the old story of the buggy whip manufacturers versus the transportation accessory manufacturers. I won't go into it, but if you see me offline, it's in business 101 in the first week in school. Okay. So really, this is the essence of the, the difficulty, if you will. Okay. Well, just, just one more point to it also is I just, as I look around the, the audience here and the people that are here tonight that are here to support uh, Mark and his staff down at SMC, I, I'm personally reminded that, you know, a lot of the people that are here the hours that these people put in at SMC during the course of a year, these are people that are residents of Shrewsbury, uh, people that are brought in from outside of Shrewsbury to help do it, to help manage. You know, we're talking how many <clears throat> employees at SMC? You know, three, two full-time employees and a couple of part-timers, I believe it is. Only something two, like that. Only three part-timers part and four full-timers. Plus, full you have an army yeah. of volunteers that help run that that um, uh, entity down there the way it is now. I think it does a pretty good job of um, manning the cameras at uh, town meeting or at uh, doing the football games or... or the, the music that you see on, or churches, or what, all the different venues that um, SFC covers. So um, that goes a long way. It's, it's the town residents that are making this thing work, and it's not just the employees. So. I, I, I just want to be clear. I, I think I speak for the board. I don't think there's any question about the quality and the commitment of the people at Shrewsbury Media Connection. 
the employees. No, or at or the commission. We have a great uh, product. I don't think other towns come to look at what we're doing here. Quite frankly, well, I so I I don't think that there's a there's a question the quality of the people who are there, the quality of the volunteers. It, that goes without question. Um, I'd like to jump away from the budget for a, a little bit, um, Mr. Hill. The reason you're looking for January 1st is because your fiscal year, Selco's fiscal year, starts on January 1st, correct? correct. Okay. Um, what, what What is the size of the, whatever you call it, the capital account right now? Oh, it's close. To, it's about 350000 Okay. Uh, um, I, I'm going to jump in here. We just um, recently looked at the present-day replacement cost of the capital equipment we have, and it was approximately 475000 Excuse me. Okay. Well, I just want this. So there is a fund that would go. Okay. Um, the, the termination benefit, um, that's available at 20 years. That's available to an employee who's of the entity that's terminated, correct? Correct. Okay. Do they have to take advantage of their term? If they don't take advantage of the termination, and I'm not suggesting that they go find another job in another public entity, but they can go to work for another public entity, right, and just take their retirement at whatever the retirement age is, 60, whatever. Correct. They could transfer. Okay. It's the termination benefit and, and what we're concerned about um, and, and everybody's concerned about that they can get to the 20 years to take advantage of that if that's what they want to do. Correct. Okay. Um, May I interrupt you for a second? But they cannot go for, technically, as it stands right now, they cannot go for the not-for-profit without the waiver. Without, without the losing what? their benefits, correct? If it went to a non-profit as of, like, yeah. the 1-1-2017, one, one, which is why we need to wait till two th one one two thousand nineteen. Yeah. But that's just I just want to point we're, out. We're not ta but no, we're not talking waiver, about waiting until they get to the right. their twenty years. That's right. what, one employee 2019? has eighteen years, the other has nineteen years. Right. Two thousand nineteen is the beginning of the Right. And that's what has been proposed. Yeah. Um, and then October twenty fifth, when this get, if this got published then. Does that mean that the board and Selco have to be in agreement on the franchise amendment? She says that we shall issue a joint report. It doesn't speak to uh, agreement or disagreement. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I don't, I don't know where the board as a whole stands, right. but if we're not in complete agreement, how can you publish? We can't. Not what? We delay. Okay. Stuff. What goes out is what the agreement is proposed to be. Correct. After the comment period, theoretically, it could go back to the table right. because the comments that were heard by everybody and say, wait a minute, we should change it this way. We have to start the process all over again, right? Correct. Well, I don't think, no, you could make modifications based on the comments. On the co based on the comments. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, anybody questions, comments? Just a no. uh, clarification. Sure. I, um, I realize that you mentioned that there were four considerations kind of going forward. I didn't particularly understand the part that you said uh, a waiver that will be in place that will not prohibit someone from going to the nonprofit side. Could that be explained a little bit better? Um, maybe I'm. I think I. I think I can. Go ahead. The ethics laws are very specific on what people in the public sector can do when they go to work for a uh, – they can't negotiate um, for a business that they're going to, basically. And so they need to be careful. And then they can't, they can't be involved with the negotiations um, going forward because it's a perceived conflict. Um, and one of the things that, um, that Selco did was um, – when this issue came up, was talk to um, actually the firm that we use for town council and ask them to research it to make sure 
that this wasn't the law of unintended consequences, and we agreed to do this, and all of a sudden find out that these two employees that we're talking about specifically, all of a sudden can't work for this at all, and they'd be out of a job. So that's what that was all about, and, and we're almost there in terms of clarification and um, approval um, or agreement, whatever, from the Ethics Commission, correct? The, the Ethics Commission signed off on the attorney's um, statement okay. stating that they were in agreement with the findings and recommendation of our attorney, of the attorneys representing the employees that right. we paid for. Right. Okay. Recently, as in the last few days. Okay. Now, subsequent to that, because, you know, to the point of the SMC advisory members, th 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 this is an obviously not s something that these employees voluntarily wanted to do. Uh, in the case of many, the statute's set up so that you don't leave your municipal job and then go to work in the private sector and then lobby against to gain inside uh, that didn't happen here. These people are being transferred, and in, for the lack of a better word, I, w I wouldn't call them victims, but the unintended consequences are that the statute's in place, and it, it, it would put them under the umbrella of these regulations uh, in an unintended way. I've asked, and I spoke to an attorney there today, is there any way that there can be a waiver for this? Um, the attorney I spoke to said, uh, there's never been a waiver in her tenure uh, at the Ethics Commission, but that she would bring it before the General Counsel for further review. But they can go to work <clears throat> for this nonprofit that's getting money from Yes, them. but they can't have a seat at the table right. in negotiating with the future Board of Selectmen. Right. Okay. Uh, if I may interject, it is very difficult for the current Board or the new board that will be coming in place to actually make these financial decisions without talking to currently Mark, uh, who is the manager and who knows how the operations run and wh where the monies are needed and how many employees are needed. And so I understand directly he cannot be involved in uh, all these negotiations, but even to make the new entity successfully survive in its initiation period, there needs to be some back and forth dialogue there. And so I think we need to protect him and the other two employees, particularly by name, just so that we create an entity that survives. Because our purpose, and that's why Mike and we, uh, us had meetings together, the whole committee, to make sure how we get there. And so that is one of the asks we have, just to make sure that all the employees are protected. Right, and, that, and that's what we're talking about. I think that we're doing everything we can to get to that. That being said, the statute is specific, or the regulation is specific, and it spells out in, in, the, in the lawyer's opinion that they can carry on their day-to-day -day functions, and Mark can do his day-to-day -day functions of budget prep and the like, but he can't negotiate the terms and conditions of any agreements between right. the board. There's a, can do there's the a dilemma, the, the advisory board is not the new board of directors, so we can negotiate, but the new board of directors is the one that has to right. sign the agreement. And so, um, right. uh, to, you know, to what level do we want to keep negotiating back and forth for something that we are going to eventually Chairman. sign? Uh, Mr. Chairman, why, why don't you become the board? You guys seem to care about the Can thing. I? Well, you have to create a new corporation. Uh, we could do that, okay, if people would be willing to do that. Um, I have no great desire to serve on this new board. I would do that as, and, and I don't think too many of the advisory board members do. Uh, I would do it to facilitate a good transfer and then get out at some future point if that would be acceptable to people. But, but yeah, you, you need to get to that new board of directors to sign any kind of an agreement that's going to hold up. Right. Um, the advisory board has no authority whatsoever. E even if we had authority over the entire operation, we're the old operation, not the new, uh, not the new corporation. So but you could be the new corporation. Well, that, that, that's a topic for yeah. another, another discussion. Yeah. 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 Ms. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so i just like to weigh in a little bit. Uh, I am the board member. <laughs> 
the selectmen who participated in um, uh, some of the discussions here. So, uh, so first of all, I guess I want to reiterate what was said um, that in, in every um, aspect of the discussions that went on, um, the employees were at the forefront of all of the decisions that were made. Um, and that, you know, the decision by the Selco Commission to defer um, the actual implementation until 1-1-2019 is a direct result of that, of the understanding of, as we've talked about, the retirement clause. And, and it gets complicated. So I think we're going to have to have, um, excuse me, the, the termination clause. So, you know, there's going to be some settling here and some understanding of what all this means. But I think what you're hearing here collectively uh, is um, the important of, importance of the board. This new board um, really um, will play an, a key role, an active role, and that became even more vital with this ethics law um, regulation that it has that comes to play. And because the director will not um, be able to have an active role in advising about um, the entity and any negotiations. I think um, we need to be very thoughtful. I think Lou speaks um, very wisely about that. I think there may be members of the current advisory committee who may want to roll on that. But I think that new board needs to be a nonprofit board. We need to be thinking about this now, going from an advisory to a, a board that actually is going to run a nonprofit operation. Very different. Um, some of us work in nonprofits. We work with nonprofits. We're talking about people who understand not only nonprofit entities, but how, how to run the business. I see a finance, you know, somebody has to have a financial interest, you know. So I think it's going to be critical. Um, and if the entity, if the new board is seven people or five people or however many the selectmen appoint and whoever appoints, you know, that's uh, the logistics. But I think that is going to be vital to. Um, to um, the success and yes, to they, they answering to a lot of these questions. They fiduciary responsibility right. for this whole operation. Right. It's a serious yeah. job. And, but it will yeah. operate. Again, I think we have to know that at some point the line, you know, so what we're, what we're doing now is we're trying to tighten as much as possible all those um, strings, all those areas to make as smooth of a transition as we can um, to certainly keep the employees as whole as possible and then what we're hearing is trying to keep the operation as whole as possible. And I think we'll be able to do that to a certain extent. But there also has to be a realization that this is going to be a separate entity. It's going to run as its own nonprofit business. Um, and at some point um, that the SELCO uh, obligation, we need it to be fair. I would like to see if we can get it. I've seen numbers. I've seen the numbers. But I think for everybody else, we need to see um, uh, more um, detailed numbers that spell out, you know, what was the budget in 14? What was actually spent? What was the budget in 15? What was actually spent? 16 actually spent. Um, and then, you know, compare that to the budget. I think there's a, an excellent budget that's been put together um, that has taken into consideration every possible uh, component of what it would take to run the operation and we will go back and forth on what that means but but I think at the end of the day there's going to be a number and then that's the number that the entity is going to have to operate under moving forward as as a separate nonprofit let so. me put on my uh, venture capitalist hat okay uh, you're bringing a new corporation to a venture capitalist what is he going to ask you he's going to ask you for a three-year pro forma set of financials Profit and loss, budget, capital equipment, all the rest of that. We don't have that right now. I haven't seen, there's been some discussion as to how much capital equipment we presently own. Uh, what is the replacement cycle? I, off the top of my head, back of envelope, if we have uh, $450,000 worth of capital equipment right now, present value, again, top of my head, the replacement cycle 10 years average, okay? Well, that means you need to be putting aside $47,000 a year for capital equipment replacement. That has not been done in the past. They've taken whatever has been left over in the budget and thrown it into something called a depreciation fund, which is in fact actually a cash reserve fund for future capital equipment purchases. So 
uh, you got to take a really close look at the capital equipment <coughs> in the next 10 years and what is it going to take in the way of budgeting each year. Uh, simple math is $47,000 a year. Maybe you can shave that down. That has not been done in the past, and I don't think it's been adequately considered in the, the numbers that I've been given. So there's a lot of loose ends on this thing yet, folks. And I, I think, unfortunately, I, I don't know where we're going to end up with this as a board with the agreement. Um, but unfortunately, until we get a nonprofit um, or well, it could be a for profit, I, the way it's set up is a nonprofit, um, uh, until we get an entity to actually sit down and work with, there's going to be a lot of loose ends. I mean, we, uh, this is change, and, yes. and change has a lot of uncertainty in it. Um, there needs and, to be a transition timetable, how this thing is going to fit in. Right. When do you form the board? Uh, when do you design uh, a, a set of financials with a new board agreeing with uh, everybody who's involved here, what those numbers should I be? Think, I think it's important to note, though, that the agreement that we're talking about this evening is, or an amendment to the agreement, is, is between the board as the licensor and SoCo as the licensee. Franchise agreement. That's, that's it. Yes. Um, the discussions, um, I, we need to be aware, um, and certainly that's what a lot of discussions about, is about what's going to happen to public access. We need to be aware of that. But, and, and we wanted your input. That's why we asked everybody here. And that's why we're going to have a public hearing at some point in the future, I, we're going we're gonna to have to establish a date on that. Um, but there will then be a discussion, if this goes through in whatever form, then there will be a discussion about with whoever the people are who decide they want to work towards forming this nonprofit. Now, the advisory board may decide they don't want to be on the nonprofit but they will work, or somebody at Choose Me Media Connection will work um, towards creating the nonprofit, work with the Board of Selectmen to come up with that. Um, and then, I mean, those discussions will take place at that time. But I think we do need to be aware that we're constrained um, as, as licensors of what we can ask SoCo to provide. Well, let me phrase that. Require SoCo to provide, and SoCo does not have to provide more than 5%. That's, that's a given. That's federal law. Um, whether we like it or not, that's it. And it can only come at the present time, the way federal law is, as I understand it, it can only come from cable revenues. Video. It can't come from anything else. Video. My, my understanding is that they can give you more than a 5%. They're not required to under federal law. And they, uh, and they yeah, don't have to. Oh, and, Mr. Chairman, may I ask yes. a follow-up on your point? If you um, took 20 miles around Shrewsbury and, and looked at how much uh, funding goes from Selco or the system to Shrewsbury Media Cable and compared it to other communities, what, what's the general relationship? Well, I, I um, would think that it's not more than 5%. So in, um, Municipalities other than the city of Worcester, I'd say it's double, double, or more. Okay. That might be interesting to have Two and a half times someone on your perhaps. staff just run to ground factually <clears throat> yeah. west of Boston, yeah. just so we could get a sense for that. Um, it, I'm listening here, and I'm, I'm almost feeling as though we're in the February budget meetings, <laughs> <laughs> where the departments are saying what they would like and how life could be perfect. Mm -hmm with a uh, dedicated fund for capital replacement, et cetera. And the town manager is at this end trying to say, within the confines of where we find ourselves, we think this is a reasonable outcome. Yeah. Um, I will tell you, when I talk to people around SPAC, excuse me, when I talk to people around town, there is a very high level of interest in SPAC, uh, street grid media cable, whatever you want to call it, amongst those who are involved and interested in it. I think tonight, if someone had said, who will be in the audience, I think I'd get 80 percent of the, the faces and names, to be honest with you, because amongst those who care about this 
function of the Selco operation. It's, it runs high, it's deep, the commitment is there, all those great things. Amongst another group in town, I don't even know that they know it exists. It's those three channels, if you will. So, um, though I understand why you're passionately arguing, and I agree with, uh, and I appreciate the passion that you're showing for this. At the end of the day, in my mind, it comes down to the same decisions we make at town meeting. And that is, you try to cut what you think is the most reasonable deal across the board. And though you'd like a perfect, uh, the funded capital reinvestment account, I'm sure the fire chief would too. I'm sure John Knight might like that as well at the highway department. I don't know if that's actually reasonable um, as we step forward. But we'll give it a look. I, I happen to believe this proposal is in, within my understanding of the world a reasonable one. I'm interested in hearing from others who have a different perspective because uh, I may be missing something. But um, when I see the level of commitment the community has made through the cable system to uh, SPAC, as I call it. I, um, I think that's a clear commitment, but it's a commitment that is heads and shoulders above others. Um, you know, on a more personal note, I always find it odd that we just can't get push-button mics for town meetings <laughs> so you know when you're actually on, and yet we could, in my opinion, make a borderline irresponsible expenditure and buy high def so everybody can see how bad my skin is. <laughs> I just, I don't see those things really being consistent with this town's approach to spending. But I look forward to the comment period and the public hearing. Can I add to that too? Oh, go ahead. I, I just think anecdotally, I think that, you know, when you're not, we operate as a nonprofit as well. You know, we're not in this to make money. Um, when your rates are lower, the percentage of revenue available for this is lower. So when you compare other towns, it may be disparate in that if Comcast is charging more for the programming, there's more money in the 5% available for distribution. Right. Yeah, that was, uh, maybe dovetail that. I would say that th there is a difference between oh, yeah, Comcast um, isn't as concerned with keeping consumer rates low, um, th and they aren't. They have so, to respond to their customers and their shareholders. Well, the, right, we don't exactly. Have shareholders. Right. We have um, so you have the so you have the balance also in there of an entity that is um, the expectation from the community is that you, that you keep the rates low. Um, so it's not just turning around and charging more over here for the consumer. Um, it, you know, it just doesn't work that way in, in our model. I would also point out, um, I guess, to some of Mr. Kane's comments too, is that the proposal here is that the funding mechanism would become effective 1-1-17, one, one, um, but the actual agreement would not become effective until 1-1-19 one, one, for reasons that we've discussed already. So there is a period of time there that they actually would be working under the proposed funding. And I don't know if that's something to consider um, if, if there is, if, um, you know, do we, do we iron all of that out before the 1-1 one, one, or do, will we have some period of time to work with it? to kind of understand it um, and then modify it should we need within the period between. Oh. I don't know. I'm throwing that out. I don't know if that's doable like, or not doable, but I could I could have darts being thrown at me right now, but right. I see it now. I still have. So my opinion is that if we're going to do it for that two years mm -hmm. and work under this budget, it's the perfect ground to see if it's a, if this is actually going to work. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. So, okay, so I'm, all right, so. If we sign the agreement and say this is the way we're going, that, yeah, we have two years to see if it's going to work, but then we've already got a commitment, we've already got a, a, a license that says we're going to do X or we're going to get X number of dollars. In order to change that, if we found out it wasn't going to work the way it was for whatever reason, what? We'd have to go through this all over again. Exactly. Right. I mean, I, that's my impression. Well, I I actually think that the budget's going to work. But well, I'm I'm not I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I'm just saying it. I mean, to say that we can use the next two years of the trial period is kind of difficult. If we say we're going to change the mechan funding mechanism on January first, um, I personally. Um, uh, I still have doubts that we can iron everything out and get this done before January 1st. That's my own opinion. Um, 
I, I could be wrong. Um, there, are, there are phases to this. <clears throat> the first one is to change the agreement, and then the next one is to work with the nonprofit. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that, that we've all talked about over time, Michael, you and I have talked about, that um, we all need some clarity on, um, and I think this is what Mrs. Miller was saying, about really what's going to happen when we go to this nonprofit entity in terms of practically what's going to happen. Um, so I, I don't, I, I, I'm not comfortable at this point that we're going to make a January 1st date. I just, that's my own opinion. The rest of the board might have a different opinion. The only issue we need to resolve by January 1st is the franchise agreement. The negotiation with the nonprofit does not need to be finalized. And of the 351 communities in the state, if they have non, if they have a public access entity, there's got to be at least 340 of them out there already in operation. So we're not reinventing the wheel. Right. We're going to the conventional model as opposed <coughs> to the unconventional model. But but I think that, and I I wasn't part of the discussion in 1983. Um, but I think 1983, 1988. Um, there was a decision made that Shrewsbury Public Access was maybe going to be different than everybody else, that we, that we had different intentions. And I think that's why, at the time, it, it was so generous, um, because we wanted to do something different. That, you know, we, we, set up the, we set up the studio. So I think, and I know times change. Look, I, I've been in situations in business where things change. I mean, that's life. I understand that. But I think way back when there was, an, there was a decision made to do it this way, and now we're grappling with how do we provide the same service but do it that way. And that's not good. It's not bad. It just is. It's different. We're taking a little bit of a different mindset than what yeah. was happening in 1983, I think. You may be right. I'm not sure that in 1983 the vision was to have a different public access. I know um, that could be true. Uh, I don't know. But I know that the vision was to have a different cable operation. Uh, and that cable operation was granted to the town or to Selco, Shrewsbury Electric Light Plant, as a means on the heels of the implementation of Proposition 2.5 in 1981, the town took a serious revenue hit. And the thought was at the time in 83 that they could recover some of those lost revenues through operating the cable franchise as a municipal operation and provide certain what otherwise would be profit to go into the town's general fund for municipal operation. I think that was the thought. I'm not sure about could, the public access. Well, you, you, you could be right. I mean, that, that I Proposition 2.5 certainly must have played into that. but. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, that that decision to not go to the nonprofit model um, t tells me that somebody thought they wanted that system to run differently. That's well, they wanted I think it was the a control issue. Model. Well, the they wanted to go to the nonprofit model, but they still wanted to right. not completely it. divorce it. We don't know, right. you know, whatever. This so is giving more control back to the nonprofit. Right. You know, right. I think it was an issue of more control, and so you know, whatever. We can second guess what they were trying to do in '83, but, but you know, we're here today, and. All right. So the, you, the problem I see with going ahead with the franchise agreement is if you set the percentage, and let's just say for the sake of talking, four percent. Now you've locked in the new corporation at a certain delivery level, which, I think we should at least sort that out because I'm hearing $400,000 is what the Light Commission thinks we can do it for and I'm hearing the SMC manager tell me 500000 and I look back at the last two years and I see 501 and 464. I don't think we have agreement as to how much it takes. So if you set that franchise agreement at 4%, you've locked in the delivery service you're going to get, which may not be the same. But I, I, no, I Again, you keep throwing that number out there, but every time you throw that number out there, you're including capital expenditures, which doesn't really fit into the fixed cost of 
the because those those can change on an annual basis. Like you have to depend on how much money you have and before you make a capital improvement. And yes, there is a reserve and there's actual cash that's going to them as of one one nineteen. If they choose to use that for capital expenditures and we choose to use that for capital expenditures, what this budget should include is to cover the cost of operating it and covering the cost of their fixed cost. Well, Not see, there, there's where I disagree. If well, you don't well, budget for capital expenditures, eventually you well, run, but run well, your... We're not, we're not going to solve that. Yeah, we're not going to solve that today. We won't solve that tonight, but one anecdotal point, uh, Mr. Chairman. In, in um, 2015, the 3% video revenue that was granted to uh, SMC to operate amounted to $293,000. Uh, out of that uh, money that was given to them, they spent 207400 so a net amount went into their reserve. In 2014, uh, based on the 3%, their amount of, uh, was 261500 They spent 178300 Again, 83000 went to their um, reserves. So in the last two years, they've operated well within the amount of money that has been re uh, well, see, I mean, just, I'd like to see but, it reconciled just, with the Hold on for a second. Let me just, I just want to be sure I'm clear. Does that include, that 3% does not include the, the two or three town employees, Correct. right? That doesn't so include. that's another, roughly, throw a number at another 150000 Yes. Okay. 160, 170. Oh, okay. And that's what's in the budget. Yeah. Right. Right, I understand. I just want to make sure when you said they were operating on 201. <clears throat> okay. Um, we, so where do we go? I don't. I'm, I'm not clear where do we go from here. So I think the next steps are that I uh, have to prepare a report for your review um, to put, you know, and come back on the 25th. And um, if you had, you know, get it to you in advance of that for your review, and then uh, we would then, um, you would sign off on it, we'd sign off on it, and then it would be advertised uh, in the uh, telegram that we'd like to make this change. And then 14 days after that advertisement, the 21-day comment period begins. So if members of the board have questions, they can come we, to me. before we, we should get them to you? Yeah. So that... Either through Christine or directly. Okay. Before the 25th, so if there's something in there that potentially yep. would change. Right. So there's expected that we will have a vote on it or an agreement, or whether, you know, on the 25th. Would we get to say that? To move it forward as a report. We're not saying as, move a, it as report, a report, which then kicks off the next phase, which is the public the co public comment comment period. phase. And then, which would include a public hearing. I would say that's yes. when we would and have. Yes, and then it. then from there we can modify, tweak it, or whatever, with the goal and the aim being agreement um, to be effective. One one, but. Um, well, it would actually go into effect one one nineteen, but whatever. Right. But to make the decision by the end of the year, so that they can begin the funding mechanism for seventeen. So we are in a very tight window. Right. So I just want to make it clear to the board: the expectation would be that we are acting on something that that is a report that we're saying as of that period in time, that report we're willing to move forward to kick off the public um, feedback stage. So. Okay, so may I just ask a follow-up? Is that correct, sure. Mr. Hale? Please don't, yeah. Okay. okay. I just want to make sure, because you outlined a very complete, thoughtful process. of So if we vote to do something I had a, on the a sane moment. It was a moment of clarity. It was no. a good one. It was a good one. <laughs> clarity. We're, not, we're saying, great, this is what we're going to then hear input on. Right. And then at some point we take a confirmatory vote. Yes. Yes. Okay. We just want to make sure yes. I understand the ground rules. Or, or, and or make adjustments based on the comments. That's fine. To make That's fine. Vote. I just want to make sure I understand the. Yeah, we, we can. Because I, I must tell you, I don't, I don't focus on this a lot, so I want to hear what people have to say. I'm not as close to it as these folks uh, who use the services. Um, so I just want to make sure that what you've outlined is what, because that sounds um, like a reasonable way to proceed, Moira. Okay. Do we, as a board, get to see that copy as well because if we are acting on behalf of the yeah. um, manager it's currently a it's a public document yeah everyone will see it at that point yes but that's after 
On the, to the 25th, it gets, we would vote to put it out, right? So we're, we're voting to put out the report for public comment. So on the 25th, everybody has access to it. But shouldn't we, as the advisory board, also be allowed to look at it at least once before? Because otherwise, as public, yes, of course we will. But if we're acting on behalf of Mark, and since we have been involved in all these discussions, it will be only prudent that we also get a copy of that report beforehand. But isn't the report just telling you everything that we've just discussed? Yeah, but it's nice to see it in writing. Well, we have a draft. Well, you don't have a draft yet. Decided, yeah. But the draft is, isn't this the draft of it? I have to uh, highlight each change. I understand, the but the document yeah. that would become the report is based on what we have right here. Correct. And anybody can see that right now, right? Correct. Okay. So you can have, you can. They have that. The whole thing? The three documents that are of, in, on play. I don't think it's unreasonable. Whatever you put together. Right. As the final that we're going to look at, the 25th, they can right. see it too. But they might not have, we might, we might not have that final document really far in advance of the 25th, so they can get the same Well, then they'll, get, they'll right. have it at the right. exact same point right. in time That's we fine. have it. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that. That's Do you have a problem with that? Yeah. Okay. I'm as transparent as you can. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Again, we're advisory. We're happy to advise you. But it's <laughs> all in here. I think Mr. Paul's it. point is there shouldn't be anything. There well, shouldn't be any real surprises. Here, right. No. Right. We are happy change is good, change always brings something positive. So we are on board with it. We don't have any, we just want to make sure what we are supposed to do, put a fair and square representation, and that's what we are trying to right. do. And, and, and I think that we are all concerned that we want to make sure that we make a decision that two years down the road we, we don't regret. So, and we are I mean, everybody it. wants to put their due diligence into it. So. And thank you for that. Anyways. Um, Thank you for they coming in, and thank you for all of you. I mean, it's really uh, the only other time we have this many people is when we have a dog hearing, so this is really <laughs> impressive. Um, but, um, you know, and when, there, when the comment period comes up, um, certainly um, all of you, if you have comments, should send them in. That's what the comment period is for. Um, and then we will have a public hearing, and, and uh, I mean, you'll, we'll get that date to you as soon as we can figure out when it will be. Okay. May I make a suggestion that you uh, have the commission and uh, the advisory board and, and through the advisory board, Mark, take these two different budgets and meld them together because we've got a $100,000 difference in the two. Well, and I, I don't, think, I don't that's, think Mark that's the money that greases the road. I don't think Mark can do it. Uh, we, we, can, we can talk well, about can, that. You can put it under the 2017. He can work on a 2017 budget. Well, I don't, but I don't think we, negotiate, we can negotiate it back and forth. I think Not with it's Mark. It's important to acknowledge the finding that we're providing more revenue than any other entity that this consultant has studied. That coupled with the fact that our rates are most lower than any other, the two don't work. There's an inherent conflict and low rates and high uh, payment to outside uh, general services provided by the organization. Well, let's we should okay. end it because we we've gone on for an hour and a half. Um, we'll get back to you on the dates. We'll get back to you folks with a copy of what we're going to see, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. Certainly send your comments in during the comment period. Thank you.